For thousands of years, devices have been used to measure and keep track of time. The current sexagesimal system of time measurement dates to approximately 2000 BC, in Sumer. The ancient Egyptians divided the day into two 12-hour periods, and used large obelisks to track the movement of the sun. They also developed water clocks, which were probably first used in the precinct of Amun-Ri, and later outside Egypt as well. They were employed frequently by the ancient Greeks, who called them Klepsidrae. The Cho dynasty is believed to have used the outflow water clock around the same time. Devices which were introduced from Mesopotamia as early as 2000 BC. Other ancient timekeeping devices include the candle clock, used in China, Japan, England and Iraq, the time stick, widely used in India and Tibet, as well as some parts of Europe, and the hourglass, which functioned similarly to a water clock. The sundial, an early clock, relies on shadows to provide a good estimate of the hour on a sunny day. It is not so useful in cloudy weather or at night and requires recalibration as the seasons change. The earliest known clock with a water-powered escapement mechanism, which transferred rotational energy into intermittent motions, dates back to 3rd century BC ancient Greece. Chinese engineers later invented clocks incorporating mercury-powered escapement mechanisms in the 10th century, followed by Arabic engineers inventing water clocks driven by gears and weights in the 11th century. The first mechanical clocks, employing the verge escapement mechanism with a folio or balance wheel timekeeper, were invented in Europe at around the start of the 14th century, and became the standard timekeeping device until the pendulum clock was invented in 1656. The invention of the mainspring in the early 15th century allowed portable clocks to be built, evolving into the first pocket watches by the 17th century but these were not very accurate until the balance spring was added to the balance wheel in the mid-17th century. The pendulum clock remained the most accurate timekeeper until the 1930s, when quartz oscillators were invented, followed by atomic clocks after World War II. Although initially limited to laboratories, the development of microelectronics in the 1960s made quartz clocks both compact and cheap to produce and by the 1980s they became the world's dominant timekeeping technology in both clocks and wristwatches. Atomic clocks are far more accurate than any previous timekeeping device, and are used to calibrate other clocks and to calculate the proper time on Earth. A standardized civil system, coordinated universal time, is based on atomic time, timekeeping devices of early civilizations. Many ancient civilizations observed astronomical bodies, often the sun and moon, to determine times, dates, and seasons. Methods of sexagesimal timekeeping, now common in Western society, originated nearly 4,000 years ago in Mesopotamia and Egypt. A similar system was developed later in Mesoamerica. The first calendars may have been created during the last glacial period by hunter-gatherers who employed tools such as sticks and bones to track the phases of the moon or the seasons. Stone circles, such as England's Stonehenge, were built in various parts of the world, especially in prehistoric Europe, and are thought to have been used to time and predict seasonal and annual events such as equinoxes or solstices. As those megalithic civilizations left no recorded history, little is known of their calendars or timekeeping methods. Ancient Egypt The oldest known sundial is from Egypt. It dates back to around 1500 BC and was discovered in the Valley of the Kings in 2013. Sundials have their origin in shadow clocks, which were the first devices used for measuring the parts of a day. Ancient Egyptian obelisks, constructed about 3500 BC, are also among the earliest shadow clocks. Egyptian shadow clocks divided daytime into 12 parts with each part further divided into more precise parts. One type of shadow clock consisted of a long stem with five variable marks and an elevated crossbar which cast a shadow over those marks. 
It was positioned eastward in the morning, and was turned west at noon. Obelisks functioned in much the same manner. The shadow cast on the markers around it allowed the Egyptians to calculate the time. The obelisk also indicated whether it was morning or afternoon, as well as the summer and winter solstices. A third shadow clock, developed c. 1500 BC, was similar in shape to a bent T-square. It measured the passage of time by the shadow cast by its crossbar on a non-linear rule. The T was oriented eastward in the mornings, and turned around at noon, so that it could cast its shadow in the opposite direction. Although accurate, shadow clocks relied on the sun, and so were useless at night and in cloudy weather. The Egyptians therefore developed a number of alternative timekeeping instruments, including water clocks, and a system for tracking star movements. The oldest description of a water clock is from the tomb inscription of the 16th century BC Egyptian court official Amenemhet, identifying him as its inventor. There were several types of water clocks, some more elaborate than others. One type consisted of a bowl with small holes in its bottom, which was floated on water and allowed to fill at a near constant rate. Markings on the side of the bowl indicated elapsed time. As the surface of the water reached them, the oldest known water clock was found in the tomb of Pharaoh Amenhotep I, suggesting that they were first used in ancient Egypt. Another Egyptian method of determining the time during the night was using plumb lines called merkays. In use since at least 600 BC, two of these instruments were aligned with Polaris, the North Pole Star, to create a north-south meridian. The time was accurately measured by observing certain stars as they crossed the line created with the merkays. Ancient Greece and Rome water clocks, or clepsidrae, were commonly used in ancient Greece following their introduction by Plato, who also invented a water-based alarm clock. One account of Plato's alarm clock describes it as depending on the nightly overflow of a vessel containing lead balls, which floated in a columnar vat. The vat held a steadily increasing amount of water, supplied by a cistern. By morning, the vessel would have floated high enough to tip over, causing the lead balls to cascade onto a copper platter. The resultant clangor would then awaken Plato's students at the academy. Another possibility is that it comprised two jars, connected by a siphon. Water emptied until it reached the siphon, which transported the water to the other jar. There, the rising water would force air through a whistle, sounding an alarm. The Greeks and Chaldeans regularly maintained timekeeping records as an essential part of their astronomical observations. Greek astronomers Andronicus of Cyrus supervised the construction of the Tower of the Winds in Athens in the 1st century BC. In Greek tradition, clepsidrae were used in court. Later, the Romans adopted this practice as well. There are several mentions of this in historical records and literature of the era. For example, in Theaetetus, Plato says that those men, on the other hand, always speak in haste, for the flowing water urges them on. Another mention occurs in Lucius Apuleius' The Golden Ass. The clerk of the court began bawling again, this time summoning the chief witness for the prosecution to appear. Up stepped an old man, whom I did not know. He was invited to speak for as long as there was water in the clock. This was a hollow globe into which water was poured through a funnel in the neck and from which it gradually escaped through fine perforations at the base. The clock in Apuleius's account was one of several types of water clock used. Another consisted of a bowl with a hole in its center, which was floated on water. Time was kept by observing how long the bowl took to fill with water. Although clepsidrae were more useful than sundials, they could be used indoors, during the night, and also when the sky was cloudy. They were not as accurate. The Greeks, therefore, sought a way to improve their water clocks. 
Although still not as accurate as sundials, Greek water clocks became more accurate around 325 BC, and they were adapted to have a face within our hand, making the reading of the clock more precise and convenient. One of the more common problems in most types of clepsydra was caused by water pressure. When the container holding the water was full, the increased pressure caused the water to flow more rapidly. This problem was addressed by Greek and Roman horologists beginning in 100 BC, and improvements continued to be made in the following centuries. To counteract the increased water flow, the clock's water containers, usually bowls or jugs, were given the conical shape, positioned with the wide end up. A greater amount of water had to flow out in order to drop the same distance as when the water was lower in the cone. Along with this improvement, clocks were constructed more elegantly in this period, with hours marked by gongs, doors opening to miniature figurines, bells, or moving mechanisms. There were some remaining problems, however, which were never solved, such as the effect of temperature. Water flows more slowly when cold, or may even freeze. Between 270 BC and AD 500, Hellenistic and Roman horologists and astronomers began developing more elaborate mechanized water clocks. The added complexity was aimed at regulating the flow and at providing fancier displays of the passage of time. Some even displayed astrological models of the universe. Although the Greeks and Romans did much to advance water clock technology, they still continued to use shadow clocks. The mathematician and astronomer Theodosius of Bithynia, for example, is said to have invented a universal sundial that was accurate anywhere on Earth though little is known about it. Others wrote of the sundial in the mathematics and literature of the period. Marcus Vitruvius Pollio, the Roman author of De Architectura, wrote on the mathematics of gnomons, or sundial blades. During the reign of Emperor Augustus, the Romans constructed the largest sundial ever built, the Solarium Augusta. Its gnomon was an obelisk from Heliopolis. Similarly, the obelisk from Campus Martius was used as the gnomon for Augustus's zodiacal sundial. Pliny the Elder records that the first sundial in Rome arrived in 264 BC, looted from Catania, Sicily. According to him, it gave the incorrect time until the markings and angle appropriate for Rome's latitude were used. A century later, Persia according to Callisthenes, the Persians were using water clocks in 328 BC to ensure a just and exact distribution of water from canets to their shareholders for agricultural irrigation. The use of water clocks in Iran, especially in Zibad, dates back to 500 BC. Later they were also used to determine the exact holy days of pre-Islamic religions, such as the Nowruz, Chela, or Yalda, the shortest, longest, and equal length days and nights of the years. The water clocks used in Iran were one of the most practical ancient tools for timing the yearly calendar. Water clocks, or fenjan, in Persia reached a level of accuracy comparable to today's standards of timekeeping. The fenjan was the most accurate and commonly used timekeeping device for calculating the amount or the time that a farmer must take water from a canet or well for irrigation of the farms, until it was replaced by more accurate current clock. Persian water clocks were a practical and useful tool for the Canets shareholders to calculate the length of time they could divert water to their farm. The Canet was the only water source for agriculture and irrigation so a just and fair water distribution was very important. Therefore, a very fair and clever old person was elected to be the manager of the water clock and at least two full-time managers were needed to control and observe the number of fenjans and announce the exact time during the days and nights. The fenjan was a big pot full of water in a bowl with small hole in the center. When the bowl became full of water, it would sink into the pot, and the manager would empty the bowl and again put it on the top of the water in the pot. He would record the number of times the bowl sank by putting small stones into a jar. 
the place where the clock was situated, and its managers, were collectively known as Karnair Fenjan. Usually this would be the top floor of a public house, with west and east facing windows to show the time of sunset and sunrise. There was also another timekeeping tool named Astaya or Astrolabe, but it was mostly used for superstitious beliefs and was not practical for use as a farmer's calendar. The Zebard Ghanabad water clock was in use until 1965 when it was substituted by modern clocks. China Joseph Needham speculated that the introduction of the outflow clepsydra to China, perhaps from Mesopotamia, occurred as far back as the second millennium BC, during the Shang dynasty, and at the latest by the first millennium BC. By the beginning of the Han dynasty, in 202 BC, the outflow clepsydra was gradually replaced by the inflow clepsydra, which featured an indicator rod on a float to compensate for the falling pressure head in the reservoir, which slowed timekeeping as the vessel filled. Zhang Heng added an extra tank between the reservoir and the inflow vessel. Around 550 AD, Yin Gui was the first in China to write of the overflow or constant level tank added to the series which was later described in detail by the inventor Shen Kuo. Around 610, this design was trumped by two Suai dynasty inventors, Geng Xun and Yu and Kai, who were the first to create the balance clepsydra, with standard positions for the steelyard balance. Joseph Needham states that, the balance clepsydra permitted the seasonal adjustment of the pressure head in the compensating tank by having standard positions for the counterweight graduated on the beam, and hence it could control the rate of flow for different lengths of day and night. With this arrangement no overflow tank was required, and the two attendants were warned when the clepsydra needed refilling.